Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I am so very glad that you're here. But as for you, you meant it evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about, as it is to this day, to save many people alive. Genesis 50 and verse 20. Now, if you do an online search, you can find a how-to video on just about anything. If you want to know how to cook a certain recipe, or fix a leaky faucet, or build a homemade rocket, you can find someone who will show you how to do that. So these are not the loftiest goals we might have. I would suggest that the most important tasks that we might want to learn how to do would be things like, how can I be a better father? Or how can I be a better wife? How can I be a better Christian? And how can I get closer to God? Those might be some, some videos that ought, to be, that ought to be made and help. Now I have a plan when I, when I prepare my, my sermons for the, the year. I have a kind of a calendar that I build for myself. And I usually have a goal in mind. I usually have a theme for that, for that year. And I decided this year that my preaching goal for 2019 is in developing leadership. Uh, we had talked a year or so ago about uh, elders in the church and uh, had moved toward that goal. But I wanted to take that process and, and broaden it and begin as well, not just necessarily developing leadership within the church as far as elders, but within the home. That would naturally spread into many of those areas. But if we're looking for an example of something like uh, elders in the church, an elder must begin as a good husband, first of all. And that has to start before one serves in that role. And for one to be a good husband, you have to start as a young man seeking to pursue that goal. And as a young man seeking to pursue that goal, you have to begin as a young boy that sees that goal represented and encouraged. So it's, it can be a very lengthy process, and I want us to, to begin that process uh, in, these, uh, in these early stages. And what we're going to do with this series, I'm going to preach a series uh, over the next several weeks about examples of leadership that are seen in Scripture. Uh, and there will be some ladies in there as well. Just to be fair, uh, a good leader is a good leader uh, and a good example. But what I want to suggest to you with this initial lesson as we begin this series is that leadership begins years in advance many times in a preparation phase that may not be as easily seen or recognized. And we certainly will see that in the example that we are uh, going to be examining this evening in Joseph, in the life of Joseph. Joseph shows us many, many things, but in regard to this, this goal in mind here, Joseph, Joseph shows us that God can turn anyone to a good purpose. Uh, and to a great destiny. Uh, there is a place, there is a role, and there is a value in everyone. So what we're going to be considering tonight in the life of Joseph is that we see, first of all, what God had to work with, how he began. We see the difficult experiences that changed him for the better. And ultimately, we see the godly man that he became directly because of those experiences. Many that were not very pleasant. But this all fits within the theme of God's character and his habit of using broken stuff and broken people. Uh, that gives him the credit, all the glory that he has deserved and that's not misplaced in any way. And that certainly begins with Joseph. Uh, turn with me to Genesis chapter 37 as we begin tonight. We're going to start by looking at the raw material of how God is going to build this young man into a great leader of his people. In Genesis chapter 37, beginning in verse 2, this is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. 
Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. So what we begin with here, what God has to work with in shaping this young man, is we have a spoiled son of the favorite wife, which was Rachel, his mother. And he's been given this, this fancy coat as a sign of that favor. And you can almost hear it in the words of the way that his relationship with his brothers is described, that it just rubs it in every time he wore that special tunic. And it only increases their jealousy of him. What we see in Joseph is a bit of an inconsiderate young man. I'm not saying that he's evil. I'm not even saying he's arrogant. I'm just saying that he seems to be very self-centered and he does not give any thought to consequences. Some of you may be saying, well, he is 17 years old after all. It kind of goes with the territory. Maybe I'm speaking from personal experience a little too much there, but we can see how that would come along. But he doesn't really think things through very well at this stage in life. He doesn't seem to learn from his mistakes because he has a dream. He's given a gift by God of being able to have these dreams that sort of foretell the future. And he has this dream and he tells his brothers, hey, I had this dream of, of all of these sheaves of grain and, and all of your sheaves were bowing down to me. Well, this did not go over very well at all with his brothers who were already jealous of him and now they're even more so. But Joseph has a second dream. And he goes and tells them again. So he didn't learn the first time. And he tells the second dream where the moon and the sun and all the stars are then bowing down to him. And this is indicating the sun and the moon is indicating not just his brothers but his parents. So Joseph doesn't hesitate to disrespect his parents in explaining this vision to them too. Yeah, mom and dad, even you were going to bow down to me. And it seems that this is a, in a rather public way. Again, not that he's doing this out of any sense of, of, of pride or arrogance or malice. He just speaks without thinking. Now, even if his dreams come true, and they would, Joseph is a young man who does not have any tact. He doesn't have a lot of wisdom about how to deal with people. So he's either not very perceptive, or he simply doesn't care. But good leaders know how to read people. They know how to read situations and when to speak and when not to speak. And if you need to speak, what you should say, what you should hold back. Where to press, where to, where to, to soften the blow. He doesn't have any of those skills yet, but he's going to learn that Joseph will become a great leader. But first, he is going to need some work. And God is going to begin that process very quickly, and it is not going to be a pleasant process. To begin with, Joseph is going to be humbled. So Joseph's, uh, so Jacob sends Joseph out to check on the flocks. The brothers have got the, the flocks out in the pastures, and he says, go and check on them. We haven't heard any reports for a while. So he sends out Joseph to see how the flocks are doing. Now, he'd already tattled on his brothers before and said they weren't doing a very good job. That didn't endear him to them at all. And he comes again and they say, oh, here comes the dreamer. Here he comes again to tell dad on, uh, to tattle on us again. So they make a plan to kill him. Some of the brothers say, let's just be rid of him. Let's just kill him. But one of the brothers, Reuben, has a, he seems to be the lone voice of reason here. And he said, no, no, let's not act rashly. Let's not kill the boy. He said, let's just throw him down into this pit and then we'll think about what to do with him. I think Reuben, to give him full credit, is trying to buy some time to maybe soften their hearts or maybe somehow get word back to Dad what's going on out in the, in the fields. But we see God's providence in this, in this all through from the start throughout the entire process. God's providence is seen here. The hand of God protecting Joseph, guiding the situation because they end up selling him to an Ishmaelite caravan 
that just happened to be passing by at that moment. And this caravan just happens to be going into Egypt. And he just happens to be sold as a slave to a man named Potiphar and not to someone else. So God is guiding this and he's shaping Joseph for the man that he needs to become. So this process begins with him being humbled. The process continues with him being tempted. So he's, he's a slave, he's been sold to Potiphar, and things begin to look up for Joseph. In 37, verse 7, uh, I'm sorry, 38. No? I wrote down the wrong scripture here. So Joseph has been sold. And we see in chapter 39 it is, in verse 7. It came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So he's been placed in charge of the household, and it seems that Joseph is learning some humility here. He's trying to make the best of the situation. Yes, he's a slave, but he's you know, the chief of the slaves and the master of the household uh, while Potiphar is gone. But things aren't going too bad, and then the, wife's, uh, the, the boss's wife starts to come on to him. And now he's faced with a very important decision. <coughs> What's he going to do? Is he going to give in to this temptation? That would be the easy path. We need to remember that Joseph is a young man here with urges. And for this prominent woman to be throwing herself at him would have been feeding his young ego. That he is someone to be pursued. And we're told that he was very good looking. And he knows that if he refuses her, that she's going to be upset. And that's probably not going to work out very well. So there's a lot of things compelling Joseph to give in to this temptation. But as a man of character, as he's growing to be, he takes a stand for God, and he also takes a stand for her husband, the very man that she is betrayed. So he stands up for God and he stands up for Potiphar. And God blesses him for this process of spiritual growth. He's becoming that man that he needs to be. He's becoming a man of character. And God blesses him in this when he resists. When she comes on to him, she attacks him. She grabs a hold of his coat. He leaves his coat and runs. She accuses him of assaulting her. But God protects him and blesses him. His life is spared. And this was a remarkable thing because a slave assaulting a noble woman, well, that would have been instant death without much in the way of a trial. And yet God is active in this process, spares his wife, and Potiphar's position allows Joseph to be placed in a very special prison where he's going to meet some important people in his future. And that's the next stage of the shaping process. Joseph is in prison. Now, there's nothing more unfair than being punished for something that you didn't do. I mean, we can just ask Jesus about that. He was punished for the sin of the world and he never committed a single one. <coughs> Talk about the greatest injustice in human history. But what we have in Joseph when he is in this prison is another choice. He's in a bad situation. He's been unfairly accused and imprisoned. And now he has a choice. He can either wallow in self-pity and feel sorry for himself. Or he can use this as another opportunity to grow in his faith and his character. Well... Luckily for him, he accepts his fate and again tries to just make the best of the situation. And he rises to be one in the prison who was given great authority as well, just like he was in the house of Potiphar. And he met someone there in the prison that was going to change his life. At first in a bad way and then a good way. The next stage in the process of shaping, of God preparing Joseph for the leader that he needs to be, is that he was forgotten. Now it seemed like an odd step, but it's vitally important. Have you ever felt like God is ignoring you? Have you ever felt like God's not listening to my prayers? He's just uh, you know, jerking me around and things aren't working out well and I don't understand why. 
How often do you think Joseph prayed to God? Why is all this happening to me? Why have I been taken away from my family? My brothers tried to kill me. They sold me. I'm a slave now. I've been falsely accused of a, of a serious crime. And I'm sitting here in prison. Why is all this happening to me? While he's in prison, Joseph meets a man who is butler to Pharaoh, one of his chief servants. And he has a dream. And Joseph is given, again, the ability by God to interpret this dream. So he tells Pharaoh's butler what this dream means. And he says, wow, thanks a lot. That's great. And the dream means that he's going to be restored to his position again. That, that Pharaoh isn't going to be mad at him for very long, and he's going to go right back into the palace very soon. And Joseph asked the butler, he says, when you go back to your place, remember me. Well, the sad fact was that the butler didn't remember Joseph. So he sits there in prison for a a little bit longer. And now he feels unappreciated. Certainly that's a natural feeling for Joseph. I mean, you can imagine him thinking to himself, well, this is the thanks I get for helping someone out. But what may have happened here, and why this uh, played out this way, is it may be that, when, that Joseph tried to take matters into his own hands. That he tried to rush things along by putting his name before Pharaoh through the butler. And that wasn't God's plan. So this is yet another lesson in Joseph for learning patience and learning to rely on God. God will do it in his own time and not Joseph's time. But finally, after all this has occurred, after it's come to a completion, Joseph is empowered by God. That's the last stage of this learning process for him. He is empowered. When Joseph humbly accepts God's timing, then he prospers Pharaoh has a dream. And the butler says, Ah, I remember now. There's a man who can interpret dreams. He's in the prison. Pharaoh says, Bring him to me. Joseph interprets the dream of Pharaoh. And he learns that there's going to be seven years of, of great bumper crops. And there's going to be seven years of famine. And Pharaoh is very grateful. So he's taken out of the prison. He becomes Pharaoh's right-hand man in overseeing the preparations for this, uh, this famine that is going to be coming. And what that does is it puts Joseph in place to help his family when the timing is right. It's all about the timing. Now, when the famine grows very severe and Joseph's brothers are driven into Egypt to find food, they meet Joseph, but they're going to find a very different Joseph than the one they last saw when they pulled him out of the pit and sold him as a slave. We'll finish this evening by looking at the finished product in this process of shaping and preparation by God that began 20-some years previous. We see that Joseph now, at this stage in his life, is a humble man. And we know this is proven because he gives God the glory for these prophetic dreams now in Genesis 41 and verse 15. As he comes before Pharaoh to interpret this dream, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it, but I have heard it said of you that you can understand the dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. He said, This isn't some skill that I have. This is something that God has done. So he gives God the glory for that. He is, uh, he is a humble man giving credit where credit is due, not trying to put himself forward. He's learned that lesson the hard way. But he has learned it. Joseph is then blessed. He marries. And his, uh, he is given two sons. God blesses him with two sons. And even in their naming. He shows himself to be grateful to God. For all the things that he suffered. And yet he's grateful to God. And that is seen in the names that he gives his son. The first is Manasseh. Manasseh means making to forget. The idea that Joseph is saying, God has given me this son and has made me forget all the bad things that have happened in my life. The second son is named Ephraim, and that means fruitful, that God has made him fruitful and prosperous. God has blessed him greatly. So Joseph is a humble man, and he is now a merciful man. He is merciful to his brothers when they come to him, and they come to him in a position of weakness and a position of need, and it would have been very easy for him to use his incredible authority to squash them like little bugs. But he is merciful to them. He could have had them killed in revenge. 
He could have just simply sent them away and let them starve as a punishment. But instead, he grants mercy to them and to his whole family. He's a humble man, he's a merciful man, and he's a wise man at this point. We see before he was very rash with his speech. He didn't think and engage his brain before his mouth started talking. But now Joseph is a man who is very deliberate. He, he thinks before he speaks, not like he was before. And when his brothers come, he doesn't react rashly. He, he thinks about these things. He, he tests his brothers to see if they regretted what they did to him. And he tests them to see if they hated Benjamin, his younger brother, the same way that they used to hate him. So Joseph now thinks long term. He's planning for the famine. He's thinking about consequences. He's considering the ramifications of, of actions and words. And he didn't do that before. So he's matured greatly in that way. And the best development in Joseph's life is that he recognizes God's hand in the entire story of his life. The good, the bad, and everything in between. And that is seen in the verse that I read at the beginning of this lesson in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. After Jacob dies, after his father dies, and then the brothers are all sort of gathered around the deathbed there, and they're looking to see, oh boy, now that our father is dead, maybe Joseph is just putting on a good act. And now that he's going to be the leader of the family, he'll be in a position to do what he always wanted to do to us. And they're just sort of sitting there waiting and saying, are you going to are you going to punish us or not? And Joseph says in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. So it wasn't just that the brothers were mean to, to, to Joseph and God was good. That was true, but it's not just that. Even beyond that, Joseph recognizes that God had to do it this way just so they could reach the point that they're at now where they all didn't starve to death. He had to be sold as a slave. He had to go into Egypt. He had to rise to power by interpreting Pharaoh's dream so that he would be in a position to set the grain aside and ration it out and be wise with the blessings that God had given so that all the people would not die. And he recognizes that now. So he, he deserves full credit for having that wisdom to see God's hand in this and trusting in God's plans and his timeline. So becoming better leaders, not just in the church, but in the home and in the workplace and every, everywhere else. That process of becoming better leaders may, may mean learning patience, and it may mean enduring trials. It may mean God uh, letting God prepare us for that role, which will only come much later. But a good leader allows himself to be shaped. Joseph was able to save his family and all the people of Egypt from physical death by starvation. Jesus Christ saved all the people that have ever lived or will ever live from spiritual death, eternal separation from God. So we can learn much from Joseph's life, how we must not seek to exalt ourselves, but rather we must become humble servants, that we should look for the blessing and the opportunity to grow in every situation. And that can be a real challenge sometimes. To try to look through the, the dark skies and see the lesson and see the blessing that is there. But it's always there. We should trust and glorify God for whatever position he has chosen to place us in. There may be great blessings that we just aren't quite ready for yet. And he's preparing us for that. But even if we feel unjustly persecuted or forgotten, as Joseph did, we will be empowered and rewarded by God if we trust in Him. So instead of being angry or frustrated over a loss of control that we feel in those situations, let us gladly turn that control over to God. Leave it in His hands. It may be that someone needs to surrender control of your life to God today. 
Or maybe you've been resisting obeying His commands. Or maybe you've been resisting becoming the leader that God wants and needs you to be. Whatever your need may be in that regard, know that God has a plan for you. He has a place and a use for you. And everything He's doing in your life is trying to bring you to that point where you can be all that He wants you to be. If we can help you in that process, if we can help you tonight to find some clarity or some encouragement, then let us help you do that. Let us pray for you if we can tonight. Please come forward and make that need known to us as we sing this song. Living below in this old sinful world 